Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, Top Predators of the Flooded Amazon, presented by NatHab Expedition Leader Renzo Zappilli. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Over to you, Renzo. Thank you very much, Rob. Welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be able today to share with all of you this very interesting uh, presentation with a lot of information related to the top predators of the flooded Amazon. Well, as Rob said, my name is Renzo Zepilli. I was born and raised in Lima several decades ago. Um, I studied a uh, license degree in nature, tourism, business management, and I also did a master's degree in environmental education. Since an early age, I studied birds, actually since I was 13 years old. So I also have worked extensively throughout these last years as a field ornithologist. And I have been working as an expedition leader for natural habitat adventures since 2014. I live with my family, my wife and my baby son in the sacred valley of the Incas in Cusco. And I lead uh, uh, some of the NADHAP trips to Monarch Butterflies of Mexico. I did almost 17 trips to Cuba when we went there some years ago. And nowadays I mostly uh, lead uh, journeys to the Amazon and also an Amazon a shorter ve version combined with Machu Picchu and the Sacred Valley. So, well, let's focus on our topic today. And I first wanted, uh, as an intro, to let you know a bit about the area that we are exploring today. And it's basically, uh, we go to the Peruvian northeastern Amazon, basically the region called Loreto. Yes, I know there's another Loreto region in Mexico. This is the Peruvian Loreto, northeast Peru. And uh, well, Peru is the third largest country in size in South America. Uh, after Brazil, we have the second largest portion of the Amazon basin that is shared uh, between many neighboring countries. And this is an amazing uh, environment. Let's think about this huge area with this main drainage, which turns to be the Amazon River. 1,100 tributaries drain their waters into this amazing course to reach the Atlantic after several weeks of navigation, if you are in a regular vessel. Uh, it's very interesting because long time ago, the Amazon River was thought to be the second in the world in terms of length, and the first one in terms of the um, in terms of the volume of water that it carried, but after some interesting expeditions that include Jacques Cousteau, uh, he discovered that the Amazon River is also the largest in length in the world. I have this picture here today that shows you the whole array of the tributaries that drain their waters into the main Amazon River, uh, lifted up to look like a this interesting array of all these branches and main rivers, just for you to have an idea of how many rivers we are talking about. And just to think about the volume that all this uh, region produces in terms of water, some scientists calculated that the amount of water that goes into the Atlantic Ocean every day can quench the thirst of the New York City dwellers for more than nine years just for you to think about this particular place. Well, the area that we explore is a very unique part of the Amazon. We consider it water world. We are actually visiting with our great Amazon cruise adventure, the Pacaya Samiria Reserve, which is a very interesting area. Uh, you can see here in my map where it's located in the northeastern part of Peru. And then how big this is. Actually, the size of the reserve is 
almost 5 million acres. It's, for you to have an idea, it's the half, half the size of the country of Portugal, half the size of Belgium, and it's actually an amazing area that we call water world because it's the reserve boundaries are actually marked by the two main rivers that form literally the Amazon River. The two main tributaries of the Amazon River are bordering the reserve. On the north, the Marañón River, and on the south, the Ucayali River. In between these two rivers exists this enormous wetland that we call water world. And then the, that we actually uh, have a chance to explore during our journey with our main vessel along the largest tributaries and with the smaller skiffs when we go to explore the different tributaries that come from the reserve. The reserve was created in the 80s by the Peruvian government and uh, this is basically our operations area. This is of course the area where the flooded forest dominates the whole landscape. Eight months out of the year, the waters are covering all the areas that can be flooded. And only four months of the year is when the water recedes to have a difference of 40 feet in between the highest peak of water that is around May and until it drains down to its lower peak, which is right now, middle October, before the rains begin, especially in the Andes, and this area will begin raising and flooding everything again. That's why most of the plants, of the plants that we see and all the wildlife that we find in this area is mostly restricted to this aquatic environment. This is the land of the black water lakes and rivers that are, uh, have, are born inside the reserve and they have their waters come from the rain that with all the organic materials that fall into these waters, releasing all the tannins and tannic acids, dyes the waters to turn them black. As, as technically speaking, they are black waters. This is the land of the flooded sabas, of the giant water lilies, like the ones I have here. And this area, we have to explore basically by boat, by boat, by large vessels. This is, for example, one of the skiffs that we use to explore the different areas. That's, for example, in the background, you can see uh, some beaches. So that's from our previous trip in September when the water is really low. It's very interesting. And that's how we explore deeply uh, not only the main rivers, but many tributaries and lakes inside the reserve. We also have the chance to go around and use our kayaks and explore these areas. Uh, one of the names that uh, has been given to this reserve by the Peruvian population is the Jungle of the Mirrors Reserve. Because as you can see in this picture, the black waters present a perfect uh, glassy environment to have this double vision, let's say, of, of what the landscape offers. This is really interesting. And another thing that I like a lot about this area are also the cloud form formations uh, combined with the forest because of the vastness of this area and mostly flat. You know, there are no nothing that comes out or protrudes from the landscape. So it's really interesting that you can see for miles the visibility of the surroundings that includes the cloud formations and the different uh, weather patterns that can change as we speak once we are there. Well, focus now on our topic today. Uh, we are going to begin talking about the predators that inhabit the flooded forest. So basically, this area has a lot of uh, species related either to the aquatic environment and to the arboreal environment. Let's say we only have or mostly have a species that live in the water or on the trees. Because as I was telling you earlier, 
parts of the reserve get completely flooded. There's not much dry land for terrestrial mammals. This part of the Amazon is not uh, basically an area where terrestrial mammals are common. Now, mostly animals in general, wildlife, flora and fauna specialize in this particular flooded environment. In terms of the predators that we have here, for example, among crocodilians, we have caimans. In the world, we have the large crocodilian order, and it's divided in several families. We have gavials in some parts of Southeast Asia. We have alligators and caimans in the New World, mostly. And we have uh, crocodiles in many other parts, including uh, the Americas. But this part of the world, in the Amazon, mostly we have caimans. There can be found between three or four different species of caimans, depending where you are. And in this part, we find mostly the white caiman, that's the one we are seeing right now, also called a spectacle caiman, because they have this sort of bony ridge above the eyes that gives them a particular um, shape of the head and an impression. And uh, they can be diurnal, but mostly they are nocturnal. And the caimans in this part of the Amazon, the largest that we have seen uh, reach a bit more than 10 feet. They are not the largest. And most of the ones that we usually find are between three and five feet long. This is mostly a nocturnal species, still in you. And part of their diet, it's composed by small uh, animals like frogs, snakes, fish. So we are talk, I'm going to talk a bit later. The, the reserve has an amazing abundance of fish that comes from the internal parts that work as a source. So for example, we have small frogs, poison dart frogs, leaf, uh, leaf frogs, tree frogs, sometimes are found on the floating vegetation. And also we have, uh, like the snake that we find in, in the right, uh, predators that are feeding on these frogs, but the caimans are, all, are considering, um, being considered in the top of the food web or the food chain are what will predate also on these aquatic snakes. Turtles, we have a large amount of uh, yellow blotch or yellow spot side neck turtles and when they are babies like these ones that recently hatch uh, they hatch mostly and right now they are hatching half october uh, that's a delicacy for some of the caimans and also for other predators that are not necessarily on the top uh, of the food chain but i get advantage of this abundant resource when all the baby turtles are just hatching from their eggs and running along the beaches especially inside the reserve, where nowadays the park has established an interesting program to protect them. But anyway, they are part of the main diet of some of these caimans. But once we talk about the very large caimans, like in this case, the black caiman, we are talking about, in some cases, monsters that can reach up to 20 feet long, if not more. And these ones are focused on completely different prey because of their size. Actually, uh, they can even, a very large caiman can even attack a human being. So, uh, so, you know, that's why we normally don't swim in these interesting waters. <laughs> but anyway, the black caimans are again mostly nocturnal and in the deeper parts of the reserve, sometimes we can see some that are more than 20 feet long are huge heads. We have this um, way to calculate the size of a caiman by multiplying the size of the head by seven. And that's how we can get the whole size of the individual that we are talking about. In case of these caimans, I was telling you that they can not only feed on fish and smaller caimans, uh, but also um, larger birds and mid-sized mammals. And uh, well, they are very opportunist. So whatever appears or comes to the river margins to get some water, especially at night, they can be 
eaten by these very large black caimans. The two other species of caimans are mostly on the group of the dwarf caimans, sort of Palusurus caimans. Well, these large caimans eat also on other aquatic species like this uh, caiman lizard, which for some people is their favorite animal in this part of the world. It's a very interesting lizard that has a combination of colors and a bit of a caiman-like head. They are mostly uh, specialized in feeding on apple snails. They have very huge mandibles to break the water snails. But these are a delicacy for the caimans because they are constantly swimming. And sometimes we see them with their tails lost because caimans attack them by the tail and they just, all their lizards, they release their tails and to escape. Well, and this part of the world is catfish kingdom, basically. More than 1,100 species of catfish, yes, like the number of rivers that the Amazon has, are found in this part of the world. This one here, for example, is a precostomus or armored catfish, which is one of the most abundant catfish found inside a reserve and is composes uh, most of the uh, diet in terms of what all the top predators and the intermediate predators can feed on. And of course, includes the human beings that harvest every year thousands of these uh, catfish from the reserve, which is actually an extractive reserve uh, for mostly their consumption. We also have in these areas the very large Paiche or Arapaima gigas. Pirarucu is called in Brazil, is the largest freshwater fish found on the earth. Uh, very difficult uh, to see actually, but we hear them usually coming out um, to breathe because these fish have not only gills but also lungs. And nowadays they are a delicacy exported all around the world, but also for the main predators. The large caimans will be very happy having a paiche for dinner. Well, let's focus now on the snakes in terms of the largest water snakes found in this part of the world. We have the green anaconda. There's another species of anaconda found in Brazil, which is the yellow one, mostly found in the Pantanal. In this part of the Amazon, we have the green anaconda. This is an amazing snake, not only because of its size and its power, but also because there are so many interesting stories related uh, to, the snake, to the snake that the locals consider it sometimes the mother of the waters. Yakumama is the name in Quechua for this snake, which means the mother of all waters. This is actually a very interesting snake in the group of the more close, uh, closely to the boas, let's say, because they don't have a toxin or a venom. Uh, they do have teeth, but not really large fangs that can inject any venom. This mostly killed by suffocation. They will bite first the prey, and then they will coil around and begin strangulating the prey. And once the prey releases oxygen to get more oxygen, the snake gives another tight um, hug, let's say, until the prey dies mostly from suffocation and then it's basically swallowed, swallowed completely. This is actually a picture of uh, the largest anaconda I have ever seen, and uh, together with uh, my co leader, friend, and colleagues, uh, we were watching this, as you can see, this one is actually, um, has killed a caiman on the left part of the picture. You can see the caiman tail. It looks like a spectacle or white caiman. And the snake is still suffocating this caiman. This one we measured and it was larger than 20 feet. It was amazing. We were just navigating in the Pacaya River, one of the tributaries that comes from inside the reserve, and one of our guides is spotted on the left side, I remember, this huge thing moving. We approached and turned to be this gigantic anaconda that was struggling with this caiman that just had 
And for a while we stood there watching a behavior and then we decided to just leave her alone. Actually, in the previous one, you can see part of the tail of the caiman on the left and um, uh, the, the foot, one of the foot, the fingers of one of the feet on the right side, just above the head. Something very interesting is also in this picture is the same, same anaconda from a different angle. We can still see on the left side part of the um, caiman's tail. And it's very interesting to see all the horse flies that were huge that are attached to parts of this anaconda. It's interesting when you see, in this case, the horse flies will leave, but it's interesting when you see ticks or other parasites that some of these predators have attached to them. Is uh, who will wonder to remove them? <laughs> that was an amazing sighting that we had actually. And then, well, talking about predators that can be found on the trees, we will switch now and talk about one of my favorite birds in the world, and this is the harpy eagle. Harpy eagle is amazing. It is an amazing species. Actually, it's the second largest eagle in the world. The largest one is the Philippine monkey-eating eagle, but still both are very powerful. These eagles are so large that they don't soar. These mostly uh, stay perched on top of some huge trees that come above or protrude above the canopy. These large trees we call emergent trees, can be huge kapok trees, uh, can be also some ironwood trees or others. And from those huge trees, the harpy eagles are just watching the surroundings to see what they can detect. In this picture, we can see that it has a mammal in its talons. Actually, uh, the harpy, the name harpy, comes from the Greek mythology. The harpy was a mythological being that came at full speed and snatched the babies from their mothers. And this is what basically this bird does. It comes at full speed once it, they detect a potential prey and it will go and snatch this prey from the trees. Mostly arboreal prey, as, as we will see in the next minutes. And with their huge talons, they will immediately grasp the prey from the thorax, mostly, from the chest, and then put their claws inside, destroy the whole torso, and fly to a nearby branch where it will begin eating it. Just think about the size of this feet and the power that they have that is three times more powerful than the amounts of pounds per square inch that a pit bull dog has in its jaws. So once they grab the prey, they just crush everything and then they fly to a nearby tree. In this case, I remember we were from above, actually on, on the canopy, I have climbed the tree and I could see this harpy was just in the next tree in front. It was in a kapok tree and was eating, was feeding on a lesser ant eater. It's very interesting because uh, this harpy eagle uh, can be recognized because it has uh, like uh, two interesting feathers that come from the top of the head. So it's a very particular uh, profile no? because there's another eagle that is a slightly smaller than this one, which is a crested eagle but uh, doesn't have these uh, bifurcated crests, let's say. In certain parts of Peru, several harpy eagle nests have been reported. They like uh, the areas, especially where Brazil nut trees are found. And uh, every once in a while, they build these very interesting nests where they will have their, their chicks. The male and female have a difference in size. Basically, females are one third larger. So that way, when both are nesting, uh, they won't outcompete each other for the size of the prey. The male being one third smaller will feed on certain sizes of prey, and the female being one third larger, larger will focus on other types of larger prey. 
And once the chicks are born, usually one or two, like this one, they have a different pattern in terms of their plumage. And also, because the, usually the, the males want to reproduce again, they will try to kill their chicks. So the mothers and females being larger will protect the chicks from their fathers. This is actually a very interesting picture. A good friend was able to take uh, that shows you the female uh, and the nest with the chick. And uh, they have these trees where they have these nests built mostly by a lot of leaf, different branches. Like you see, uh, you can see like most of the, of the uh, raptors do. But it's interesting that they keep on bringing from the behavior that we observe, they keep on bringing a lot of very fresh uh, branches with fresh leaves of certain trees that may act as a sort of repellent because of all the remains from what these eagles have been eating, a lot of flies are attracted. So, and bees and wasps and other nasty insects. So by bringing these branches that have this sort of uh, repellent, uh, they try to scare away some of these bugs. Something that is really interesting when you have the chance to observe a nest for a while is that at the bottom of the nest, uh, an, am an amount of skulls and bones and different remains of their prey are accumulated. And this is what basically uh, the researchers use to identify what the eagles have been feeding on. Uh, in this case, for example, this is a monkey skull. And uh, it's very interesting because the mastozoologists, the biologists that study mammals, sometimes just find certain bones or certain parts of a leg of a tail of, of just something that was not completely eaten by the eagle. And that allows them to identify the types of prey that they feed on. From some of these studies, actually, uh, researchers have determined that monkeys are a large percentage of their prey. You know, among what they eat are uh, these, for example, the common squirrel monkeys that we find here. It's uh, one of the smallest monkeys that we can find during our journeys. Usually they travel in very large troops uh, that can have between 80 and 100 different individuals traveling together. They have very interesting high pitches that allow us to detect them before we see them. But once you find them, suddenly it's like it's raining monkeys. They are just moving all over the forest and it's, it's a very interesting show to see how some of them are largely built. They look like chunky monkeys. And these are usually the, the large males that are the alpha males that uh, are in control of the whole troop. And then sometimes we find these monkeys carrying their babies in their back, like in this picture. And it's very interesting because usually first you see the outer ring of the troop that has the very uh, aggressive uh, alpha males and beta males that are protecting the core. And then once the first monkeys go by in front of us, then you see mothers with babies going by and sometimes parents also, and they're both parents carrying their babies in the back to protect the central part. It's very interesting because what an eagle will do when they find a troop of monkeys like this, well, usually this troop of monkeys also go in what we call mixed troops with a very smart brown or tufted capuchin monkeys. These monkeys are very smart. Meanwhile, the common squirrel monkeys will feed mostly on small insects and some shoots and certain fruit. The capuchin monkeys will be mostly foraging on palm uh, trees and they will be looking after eggs, small chicks, uh, sometimes frogs, snakes, and moving together in this mixed troop will allow them to protect better against predators like the harpy. For example, in a troop of a hundred screw, common screw monkeys, there will be in the same mixed troop about a dozen of capuchins. 
and the capuchins will be looking around because of their way of foraging. They will be more alert of their surroundings and they can detect easily if, a, if an eagle is in their surroundings. So what the eagles will do is they will come and instead of being completely silent, they will you know, vocalize two or three times. And then the monkeys will begin running. That will allow the eagle to see which of the monkeys of this mixed troop are a bit slower because they might be ill or they might be older. And those are the ones that the harpy will focus on. And that's very interesting because that way, and this, this works for all the top predators, they are not only feeding off on what the whole trophic uh, web is offering them, but also they are working as a sanitizing element uh, in terms of uh, eliminating, you know, by natural selection, every animal that is not the fittest of the fittest of the of the whole uh, troop that, or the species that they are focusing on. Remember, these monkeys are so intelligent that they have the chance to, or, or actually, they use tools. And sometimes you see them cracking nuts against certain branches, or sometimes a big round fruit uh, that is uh, called cannonball that is related to Brazil nuts is what they use, uh, what they break by hitting on branches. Now that's really interesting. Then we also have the common woolly monkeys. These are monkeys that are found in the area that we explore. Common woolly monkeys are a bit larger. Uh, well, of course, a lot of, of their bodies uh, is, are composed by the amount of fur that they have. They have a very furry, you know, woolly appearance around that actually protects them against insect bites and also works as a very interesting raincoat and warm coat when storms arrive. The local people call these monkeys the uh, choros or pickpockets because sometimes they can approach a boat and steal whatever they find or get closer to the, where the people live and take something with them. They are not afraid at all uh, of human beings and sometimes they can, they will approach. If we are navigating on a tributary, they will come close to one of the skids and shake the branches and sometimes try to throw, uh, throw you things to trying to scare any potential threat away. Very, very interesting. Uh, common woolly monkey in this case. This is another picture of these woolly monkeys uh, that usually travel in small family groups, not, not like, neither like the capuchins nor like the squirrel monkeys. The woolly monkeys usually go just in small family groups of three to seven individuals. And uh, most of the day, uh, once they have finished foraging around, you can see them hanging around and literally hanging because they have this very long prehensile tail that works as a fifth limb that allows them to hang from the tail to reach some of the fruit and other things that they are feeding from the branches around. Actually, these monkeys like a lot the pulp from certain fruit. Sometimes they swallow the fruit completely. So this is one of the monkeys that works uh, uh, as a, a seed dispersal unit, let's say. And you know, based on what the researchers discovered, especially in Southeast Peru, where they were able to track several harpy eagle nests and uh, collect the remains at the bottom. Remember that the area where we, uh, where, that we explore is basically water world. So if there are nests, the remains from those nests will fall into the water and other things will get them. Uh, but in an area where you can find dry terra firma forest, the remains of what the eagles eat that can be collected. And in this case, these researchers determined that more than 60% of the diet of the harpy eagle is composed by sloths. And we are talking about two species of sloths that we have in this part of the Peruvian Amazon. We have the, the three-toed sloth, that is mostly what they get because it's a diurnal species and they forage at daytime, very exposed on the top of certain trees. They like a variety of trees to feed on the tender shoots and leaves that uh, are part of their diet, but 
there's this particular fast growing tree or pioneer tree called Cecropia. It's a very easily uh, identified because of its white bark that is the favorite tree for sloths. And that's where the harpies, the harpy eagles, will come at full speed and snatch the sloths and eat them on a safe place. In this particular case, for example, this sloth is a male because uh, in this species, the three toed sloths, uh, males and females have a bit of sexual dichromatism. The females don't have that buffy uh, patch that is actually a velvety patch of fur that the sloths have in the upper part of their backs. And the males actually have this kind of rusty, buffy patch that gets darker as they age. And that's how we can determine if the individual is a male or a female. And well, uh, one of my favorite aquatic mammals is the giant river otter. This is an amazing species that inhabits the part of the Amazon basin and the Pantanal in Brazil. These otters uh, actually uh, were almost at the brink of extinction because especially in the 70s, they were hunted extensively to use their fur in their, in the, well, in the, uh, their skins were used for the fur trade because of the quality, very high quality of fur that these otters have. Just in Peru, in the 70s, more than 20,000 skins were exported. Uh, gladly, nowadays, they are protected, you know, by law, and they are found in some remote areas of the Bacaya Samira Reserve. They are usually in groups, their groups as a family group, that is usually uh, uh, the female is the one that leads. And the groups can have between three, four, up to 12 individuals we have counted. These giant river otters uh, can weight up to 60 pounds and they can reach sometimes almost seven feet long from the tip of their nose to the tip of their very long, uh, powerful and flat tip tail. Usually you see them uh, laying on the margins or certain rivers. Uh, they move a lot throughout the forest and they like a lot uh, leaving, uh, to leave the main rivers and go into secluded tributaries or into lakes. But uh, when uh, certain times of the year, they go to the main rivers and that's where we can see them uh, just laying on a log, basking in the sand, or just in the water fishing. These are actually uh, feeding machines. The giant river otters are in the mustelid family. They are very closely related to otters, ferrets, weasels, uh, but this is the largest uh, member of this interesting family. Top predators for sure. Uh, they look really nice, but they are not a nice, animals to all the other animals that share uh, the habitat with them. Actually, for example, these giant river otters uh, feed uh, uh, on around eight pounds of fish a day. Eight pounds of fish a day per individual. That's just amazing. And they, that's why they are a very interesting uh, biological indicator of the healthiness of a particular environment because to get that amount of fish per individual multiplied by the size of the pack uh, just they need they need a constant uh, supply of fish they normally hunt as a group as a pack they go underwater as a phalanx and they try to corner the fish to a certain into a certain area, sometimes close to the bank, and then they will surround the fish and they will all get their catch of the day. Sometimes you can see them getting very large fish, some catfish that we have in the area, like the shovel nose tiger catfish, can reach up to six, five to six feet long. And sometimes we see giant river otters, three or four, having one of these really large catfish that definitely they have hunted as a pack. 
something very interesting about these otters is that they all have very particular throats, throat marks. That's a way we can identify them. When you approach a uh, otter pack, usually it's a female, the one that will come first, they will periscope up, they will periscope up, and that's the time that we have, sometimes just a second, to get the pattern that they have on their throats. These patterns allow us to determine which individuals are part of that particular pack. Different parts of the river have different packs. It's very interesting. And when you see them on a particular part of a river, how they have marked all their territories with the remains of the fish that they have been eaten. And also they do some certain scratches on the, on the banks of the river. And usually you might find their dens and their logs that are sometimes found also over the water. And they usually have between three and five different dens because that way, actually they rotate from den to den to allow the inside part of the den to get cleaned because of the, all the feces and uh, organic materials accumulated immediately it gets attacked by bacteria and other things. So they have to constantly rotate their dens to allow nature to clean them. In this particular picture, we can see this is a young one, an immature individual that was also uh, probably a one year old member of that pack. And it has a particular throat pattern again. It's like blotches of color that allow us to identify them. And uh, we are always doing citizen science when we are traveling, around, traveling uh, throughout our journey. So we send these pictures to researchers that are actually doing extensive studies of giant river otters in South America. So that way they can track the families and see year after year if the individuals and the families that we keep on finding are the same ones. In this particular case, this young one has to stay together with the family because it can be predated by a large black cane. But if a black cane and is found alone, the whole uh, a giant otter pack can attack and kill the black cane. So that's something very interesting that these two top predators, uh, you know, share the top of the food chain, but you know, they, they both, when they are young, can be eaten by the other predator respectively. It's another individual of that same pack. It looks, this one looked like the female when we saw it because it was the first one that approached the skiff and showed us the whole pattern. And we have been finding that sometimes we don't see the whole uh, pack or we see different packs, smaller ones on different parts of the river, but this female is always present in that particular section of the river. And then again, a different one, mostly whitish throat pattern, but with a little black spot that you know allowed us to identify it as a different individual. Then, well, to begin, the closure of this presentation, sometimes certain researchers don't consider this uh, a top predator, but I wanted just to mention it because personally speaking, I think also it's one of, of the top predators that shares the aquatic environment with the other ones that I mentioned in this particular part of the world. And I am talking about the pink river dolphins. Uh, actually, pink river dolphins are very interesting because they come from a very ancient lineage of dolphins that got trapped in an internal sea that was created in the middle of the Amazon basin when the Amazon River changed direction. Long time ago, the Amazon River used to flow to the Pacific before the Andes Mountains existed. And once the Andes Mountains existed and began arising, all the water that was coming from east to west got trapped in the middle of this continent. And that's apparently the time when this ancient lineage of dolphins got trapped inside this area. The Andes continued arising, the water flowed into the Atlantic, and these Pink River dolphins eventually uh, met with uh, met the gray dolphins that apparently uh, have their ancestors related to the more common marine bottlenose dolphins. But when they entered the Amazon and found these 
that the pink river dolphins were already living there, they reduced their size gradually because they were feeding on different sizes of prey, not to outcompete with each other. The pink river dolphins uh, are very difficult. Uh, well, they are uh, commonly found, but very difficult to get pictures of. They don't breed like other marine dolphins. They seldom come out and show their very blunt dorsal fin. They are large dolphins. They can reach seven feet long. They look pinkish, but not all of them are pinkish. When they are born, they are more gray and they get pink, more pinkish as they age. They have a very interesting structure that, have, that uh, allows them to navigate through the flooded forest. When the forest floods, all these branches, trunks, and roots of the huge trees are underwater, and the dolphins are just able to navigate through this maze of branches and roots, you know, uh, more than eight, uh, eight months out of the year. That's why, for example, one of the main differences between these dolphins is that marine dolphins can move their necks up and down. Let's say Flipper could say yes. But Pink River dolphins can say yes, and they can say no. They can also move uh, their necks sideways from right to left due to certain vertebrae that they have that allows them to navigate the flooded forest. Uh, they have uh, an immense uh, power in terms of the how they use the echolocation, like a sonar underwater, to find their prey. And the big thing in their foreheads is called the melon. And that's where they have this sonar. And then it's very interesting that these dolphins are actually uh, all day and night active because half of their brain is active and the other half, the other hemisphere is sleeping. And they switch hemispheres because of course, as they are mammals, they have to constantly uh, be breathing so they can just they cannot just go and sleep and you know imagine they will stop breathing that's some of the adaptation that this amazing animal has well folks thank you very much actually uh, this was my pleasure sharing again all this information from the top predators that we can find in this very interesting part of the amazon that we gently call water world and well rob I don't know if there are some questions from our audience. Otherwise, uh, I appreciate very much that uh, you took the time to listen and learn a bit more about this very interesting part of the world. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Renzo. Now, before we do start in with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone you can submit your question via the question field in your control panel. Okay, so let's get to some of these questions. Are caimans dangerous to the dolphins? And what predators go after the dolphins? Uh, that's something actually very interesting. Uh, the caimans are not uh, really dangerous to the dolphins. The dolphins are very smart and they take really good care of their young, of their offspring. Uh, but they, it, there can be a problem. Considering that all these animals that we mentioned are top predators, if one of their young uh, you know, um, individuals is left alone, other top predators can predate on them. So that's in a way, yes. You know, it, it, there can, there's the chance. And then uh, the dolphins uh, um, sometimes will feed on small caimans, but mostly they prefer fish. That's basically what will happen in this case. Great, thank you. So would river otters ever attack a human who's walking in the river? Actually, that's a very interesting question. And, uh, I've heard of two cases when uh, when otters actually, on one case, beat a person that was swimming and approached too much, and they had some of their cups. And this otter came and beat the hand of the person that was swimming. I think more like to uh, try to scare the person away, not really to harm it, but to set 
like a line say don't cross this line okay this is our territory and we are trying to protect our cap i think that was that particular case and in another case i have a personal friend that was swimming on a small tributary the others came just uh, periscoping out doing a lot of these voices they make something like that and that they're just trying to scare him away he just understood immediately the sign turned around and left those are the cases that i have heard about personally speaking great thank you for the answer appreciate that so are the anacondas only aquatic or do they come ashore and climb trees to catch prey uh well they are mostly aquatic they are usually found along floating vegetation or sometimes along the their edges of the river sometimes submerged trying to wait for something that will like come uh, and to drink some water but uh, sometimes they leave the water and approach they can approach a farm if they if she smells that there are chicken around for example let's say or uh, usually when we find them on land is because they have eaten something and when they are digesting they cannot submerge the amount of uh, gastric acids uh, and fermentation process that they have inside their bellies uh, creates this sort of bubble that doesn't allow them to submerge that's some that's why sometimes we find them just coiled around logs on the river banks after they have had a big meal and depending on the size of the anaconda it can be between two days or a week that they need to be outside to digest from the prey that they they ate but it's amazing that they can eat something so big how how is it that they can do that it's very interesting because uh once they bite their prey and they kill it by strangulation they uh disengage their jaws they can separate the jaws you know and then just the mouth opens as much as the skin and the head can and that's how they can swallow huge huge prey uh, there have been reports you know, from the early spaniards that colonized the, the area from the conquistadors that sometimes they found anacondas that have eaten a human being and once they open it they found them inside so imagine this how much they can perfectly dislocate their jaws to be able to swallow huge prey but i think that those those individuals are, nowadays are very very real uh if not uh, you know non-existent anymore but still they depending on their size they can eat something uh considerably big so are there piranhas in this part of the amazon Oh yes, <laughs> piranhas, uh, especially in the black waters, we have more than four different species of piranhas. Uh, we have the red-bellied piranha, the most common one, spotted piranhas, and in some parts of Brazil and downstream from where we are, the black piranha. But actually it's interesting because piranhas have been in a way, I would say, demonized by the by the movie, by the movies, uh, because uh, Piranhas mostly feed on fruit. Their very sharp teeth allow them to get the fruit that falls from the trees over the flooded forest. And that's why they perfectly can get this. But just like sharks, when they smell blood, they get very excited and they turn into a frenzy of feeding moment and they all will go and eat part of what they have found. This means that in a way, piranhas are also getting rid of any animal that is injured or something that has died and fallen onto the, the, the waters of this flooded forest. So they, in a way, they are also a cleansing agent. Anyway, when when if you are catching piranhas, and uh, sometimes we do catch and release, it's good to be very careful to when you remove the hook because most of the stuff that works with us on the area have piranha scars in their fingers <laughs> from bites. Great, thank you. So, does Nat have run trips? Can I come and see Waterworld? Yeah, of course. Yeah, we run trips around here. We have around 10 uh, trips um, in which we travel the, in this area for about uh, nine days. And we have also 
uh, at least four times a year, smaller versions of these trips that are combined with the Machu Picchu and Cusco area. So it's actually very interesting uh, because something that is uh, notorious here is what we will call the seasonality, how water world looks when it's dry and how it looks when it's 40 feet higher than the lowest uh, stage, let's say. And will I have a chance to see some of these uh, predators and these animals that we've talked about? Yes, actually, uh, all the pictures or most of them have been from the area that we explore. And uh, some are more rare, of course. Top predators are usually very rare because otherwise, if they are conspicuous, it will be very difficult for them to hunt. And so that's why, like it happens in other parts of the world, top predators are very elusive and they have certain times of the day when they are active. But yes, we do. Uh, oh, we have uh, we put all our efforts on finding some of these very interesting species. Huh? It's actually interesting because different times of the year uh, offer us different um, animals depending on how much the water level is, uh, depending how much fruit is available, how much how much fish is there. So it's very interesting. You can actually come twice to visit us and see the differences between the low water season and the high water season. Well, wow. sounds great. Well, Renzo, unfortunately, that's going to be the last question that we do have time for today. So I'd like to hand it back to you for any closing comments you may have for us. Well, thank you very much, Rob. I appreciate again uh, your time uh, to listen to some of these um, to some of the interesting information that we can share. And of course, you are welcome to visit us. We will be sharing more interesting information, sightings, and memories once you join us in one of these amazing adventures. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you're interested in information on how you can travel with us at NatHab, give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We will see you next time.